I'm Catherine Pompilio with an episode from the Lawfare Archive for March 13, 2022. After Russian forces attacked and captured two Ukrainian nuclear power plants, there was a sharp increase in nervousness among officials and civilians about a potential nuclear catastrophe as a result of the conflict. Last month, Russian President Vladimir Putin also ordered that Russian nuclear forces be placed on high alert and warned that, quote, No one should have any doubts that a direct attack on our country will lead to the destruction and horrible consequences for any potential aggressor, end quote. Many broadcasters compare the current crisis and fears about nuclear catastrophe to the sentiments felt during the Cold War. For today's archive episode, I picked an episode from February 2020. In the episode, Jack Goldsmith sat down with Andrew Vasevich to discuss the ways in which American foreign policy failed to capitalize on victory in the Cold War. I'm Jacob Schultz, and this is The Lawfare Podcast, February 18th, 2020. In what ways did American foreign policy fail to capitalize on victory in the Cold War? Andrew Basevich, professor emeritus at Boston University and co-founder and president of the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft, tackles that question and more in The Age of Illusions, How America Squandered Its Cold War Victory, which is Basevich's new book. Jack Goldsmith sat down with Professor Basevich to talk about the premise of the book. The pair discussed the establishment consensus on American foreign policy, the state of civil-military relations, and the mission of the newly founded Quincy Institute. It's a Lawfare Podcast, Episode 509, Andrew Basevich on The Age of Illusions, How America Squandered Its Cold War Victory. So the name of your book is The Age of Illusions, How America Squandered Its Cold War Victory. Andrew, can you please explain the basic thesis of the book? Well, the story I try to tell is the story of how we go from the moment of euphoria, the fall of the Berlin Wall, this time of great triumph, when the future seemed to be ours for the making, Uh, From there, in 1989 to 2016, when a deeply divided nation elects as president someone who, in my judgment, was totally unqualified for the office. So I'm trying to explain how, in this relatively brief period of time, we go from A to B, where A looks great and B looks pretty bad. And indeed, your claim is, I think this is fair to say, tell me if this is right, your claim is that our response to the end of the Cold War led, put in motion a series of events that led to the election of Donald Trump. Is that fair? That, that is absolutely correct. I mean, and, and in, implicit in that is my claim, and it's certainly not a claim uh, unique to me, uh, but my claim uh, that uh, Trump ain't the problem, uh, that uh, Trump is a consequence of a series of problems that, in my argument, Uh, evolved over this roughly quarter century period of time. You know, I am impressed by the extent to which in the anti-Trump camp, there is at least, at least implicitly, uh, the belief that if we can just get rid of Trump, the individual, this president, uh, then all will be well. And I think that is, uh, is deeply misleading. Right. So we'll get to your claim that Trump is really epiphenomenal on on other factors. But let's walk through the argument first. So you argue that the end of the Cold War left the United States without an enemy and without a framework for understanding the world and its place in it. And you also argue that we kind of blew it. We blew it in the way we reacted to the end of the Cold War. Can you explain that? Is that a fair characterization? Yeah, I think so. In this moment of great euphoria, uh, when, to quote the famous uh, article uh, by Francis Sukiyama, it appeared that we had reached the end of history. At that particular moment, uh, it seemed like there were very few obstacles that would prevent the United States from creating the, 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 the history that was gonna follow the end of history. And in my judgment, several claims emerged in particular to shape policy going forward through the post-Cold War administrations. And one of those claims was the conviction that globalization was going to make everybody rich. 
I mean, I'm, I'm say, saying it rather baldly, but certainly there was the belief that globalization had the capacity to create wealth on a hitherto never experienced scale, and that uh, globalization would lead to at least a, a general uh, sharing of that, uh, that, that greater wealth. All, all would benefit. I think a second idea, a complement to the notion of globalization, was a conviction that at the end of the Cold War, the United States had achieved a level of military superiority that really amounted to military supremacy. This was linked to a belief that technology uh, held the key to success in future wars, all future wars, and that because we believed at the time uh, that we kind of owned technology, that we would be able to maintain this, this military supremacy in perpetuity. And, and I'd want to emphasize that globalization and military supremacy kind of go hand in hand. Uh, if globalization is going to work, we need to have some kind of order, uh, a global order, and military supremacy seemed to equip the United States to enforce and maintain that order. The third conviction that I think matured, emerged in full flower uh, after the Cold War, is the notion, the, 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 the tendency to define uh, freedom in terms of individual autonomy, an expanded notion of freedom that was pretty light on uh, duties and obligations uh, and emphasized uh, privileges. And although certainly this worked to the, to the benefit of certain groups that had suffered discrimination for generations, if not for, for centuries, in, in my judgment, and this is very much a conservative's point of view, uh, it also gave rise to a series of pathologies that have since uh, afflicted us. And then the fourth, the fourth element, I think, of what I call this post-war consensus has to do with the role of the presidency in the, uh, in the American political system, expectations invested in presidents that created a distortion in our political system and uh, you know, sub subordinated to Congress in terms of its, its role and, and place in our political life. Uh, and I think that, too, also uh, led to negative consequences. So those are the four things you think that we kind of embraced as a nation and at the individual level after the Great right. War. Why? I mean, you a couple of places in the book you say that we should have done more self-reflection, we should have had more re what you describe as remorse, repentance, and even restitution. You said it should have been a time for self-reflection, and instead it turned into a time of kind of self-aggrandizement, self-serving action, self-interest. So why didn't we engage in that more self-reflective posture? And, and really, it, was it realistic? I mean, we just had this huge military, this historic victory over the Soviet Union, and we did seem like a colossus on the world stage. Was it really possible for us to do that? Well, I don't know. I mean, it would seem unlikely. I do remember that, the, the, I don't know if you remember, the closing scene in the movie Patton. Uh, and it's, it's George C. Scott doing a voiceover, recounting the practice in ancient Rome uh, when the Roman legions had, uh, you know, ventured forth and won great victories that the general would be, when, when the general re returned back to Rome itself, would be treated to a triumphal parade and everybody be throwing roses his way. And yet uh, in this voiceover by George C. Scott, there was a slave standing behind the victorious general reminding him that all fame is is fleeting. So that at least testifies to the possibility of reflection at a moment of triumph. Uh, it didn't happen. You, your question was, why didn't it happen? I think in, in many respects, it didn't happen. Uh, and I would, you know, I could point to myself as, as guilty here as well back, in, back at that time. We had fallen into the habit of thinking that the Cold War defined history, uh, that that history was centered on this conflict between East and West, between liberalism uh, and communism. And therefore, uh, when the Cold War ended as it did, uh, abruptly, suddenly, unexpectedly, it was easy, I think, for observers to fall into the trap of saying, not simply that we had prevailed in this uh, decades-long crisis, but, that, but something, that something definitive 
had happened. Uh, and, and that therefore we were empowered going forward to explain, to define what was going to happen going forward. So I think, I think that the response was understandable. But I also think that the, responsible, the, the response ended up having uh, tragic consequences. Right. And that's basically what the rest of the book is about. You lay the blame, I think it's fair to say, that you lay the blame for the posture that we adopted after the Cold War at the hands of what you at one point describe as disturbingly inbred and a self-perpetuating political elite. And you're pretty hard on elites in the book. Who are these elites? Why did they embrace this cluster of views? I mean, it seems like the best explanation is to kind of serve their interests, but I'm not sure you want to quite say that. Who are these elites and why did they embrace this view? Well, the elites are the people who dominate the public uh, conversation on, on matters of public interest. So, you know, that's the New York Times and the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal. And it's the, uh, uh, it's the faculty, the, the pr prominent faculty at our first class universities. It's the it's uh, uh, significant figures in think tanks, and certainly it's elected officials and those who aspire to be elected officials, and certainly it includes corporate leaders, a cluster cluster of people who it seems to me, not, a, not in a conspiratorial way, not even in a very organized way, uh, but, but whose interaction tends to shape the public discourse on, on all sorts of, of matters. And I think, you know, I, one of the things I talk about in the book uh, very briefly is how there, there, there have been different times uh, in American history where identifiable ideas emerge at a particular moment when they are, they are ripe. The, the example I give is that uh, at, at the end of the 19th century, when the period of uh, continental expansionism uh, has ended, and we've got people like uh, Frederick Jackson Turner and Alfred Thayer Mahan uh, offering up ideas that basically make the case for the imperative of extracontinental expansionism. What follows? Well, what follows is the Spanish-American War. <laughs> it's this bout of American imperialism. It is not the case uh, that Frederick Jackson Turner and Alfred Thayer Mahan caused the Spanish-American War. They didn't cause the annexation of the, of the Philippines, but they laid the basis for the events that then occurred. And I think something of the same, what we, you could say the same thing at the, at the beginning of the Cold War about the role played by somebody like George Kennan uh, in, in defining the strategy of containment, which of course implicitly assumed that we were locked in this cosmic rivalry with the Soviet Union. I think something of the same happened at the end of the Cold War. So one of the four strands you mentioned, and I think one, one that you've written about before, is what I'll call global militarism, or basically the assumption that we need to maintain military presence and military superiority around the globe. And the last two presidents, uh, Obama and, and Trump, both in different ways, kind of ran on the platform that promised to cut back on that. And in office, I think it's fair to say that they at least initially took steps in that direction, but they were thwarted. And I think that it's fair to say that they were thwarted by some of the elites you're talking about. Ben Rhodes called it the blob. This consensus, this powerful consensus in Washington, whether it emanates from the Defense Department or the National Security Establishment, but they, 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 they did run on those issues, and they, they were not successful, and they ended up being absorbed by or giving way to what I call global militarism. First of all, is that an accurate account? And second of all, why? Why does that happen? I do think it's an accurate account. Why, why it happened is complicated. I mean, there are multiple factors here. Eisenhower gave us, explained one of them uh, back in his farewell address in 1961 when he cited the military-industrial complex which of course is not simply a relationship between uh, the military itself and defense contractors, but it's a relationship that involves uh, members of Congress and even members of the, of the academy. I mean, there's, there's a lot of people with their hands in this seeking money to advance their own particular agenda. I don't think that the military industrial complex is actually as powerful as it was 
back in 1961 because the percentage of our GDP that we spend on the military is substantially less than it was then, but it exists and it continues to have influence. I think another factor here kind of connects to Vietnam, and that is the way that the imperative of supporting the troops, of, of, of not committing the mortal sin, of, of blaming soldiers for misguided policies. Some of that happened during the Vietnam period. So the imperative of always supporting the troops, I think, creates a barrier for thinking critically about uh, the essence of U.S. national security policies. I mean, I think we, we, we see that in some senses in, in the way that our endless wars, as they, as they are called, don't seem to elicit anything like a critical discussion in, um, in the political class. R rather, everybody keeps appropriating the, 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 war, the, the money necessary to keep the war going because nobody wants to be charged with not properly supporting the soldiers. So, that, so that's an element, I think, of the problem. And the third one is that during the course of the Cold War, and this is something that continues after the Cold War in many senses, I think, is, uh, is reinforced, the establishment came to embrace a, a conception of global leadership in which military power played a central role, that, that acquiring and being prepared to use in using, uh, as, the, as the occasion seemed to demand, military power came to define the essence of what we understand to be American global leadership. So when we have somebody like a Barack Obama or uh, his successor, uh, Donald Trump, coming from completely different you know, parts of the political spectrum, saying they're gonna, they're gonna break that, they're gonna end that, they are, they are arguing against a, a, a set of habits, a, a, a propos propositions that are really deeply entrenched, have come to be deeply entrenched uh, over over the course of decades. And I think then the other factor is, is that the American people, in some senses, really don't care. Uh, and therefore, they're not responsive to arguments that our military policies are misguided. Why don't they care? They don't care because, of course, we've got an all-volunteer force, and therefore, the vast majority of our fellow citizens are insulated uh, from the negative effects of wars, and because we don't even pay for the wars. Uh, you know, it's all it's all put on the charge card. It, it, I, I, I do believe uh, that uh, if we funded our wars on a, on a, on a pay-as-you-go basis, you know, the, if your taxes and my taxes went up uh, because we are in the whatever it is, 19th year of our war in Afghanistan, uh, then, then we all, I think, would probably be uh, more attentive uh, to what's going on with the U.S. military in Afghanistan. So you referred to the all-volunteer force, and you did that as an explanation for why most Americans don't care. And basically, the claim is most Americans don't have skin in the game. It's a small percentage of Americans. And in the book, you really go after the idea of an all-volunteer force and say that it's really not volunteered, and it's not terribly fair what's going on. Could you explain that? Yeah, people join the services for a variety of uh, reasons. But I, I do believe it is a fact. Uh, that were it not for were it not for the fact that we pay our military today a pretty decent wage, you know, a kid a kid who graduates from high school uh, and is uh, trying to imagine what his or her future looks like, probably can get paid better in the United States military than in almost any other you know reasonably available occupation. And the military offers medical care, and the military offers the prospects of a pension. And in order to sustain that force, to create the force and to sustain that force, we're spending hundreds of millions of dollars every year on various and sundry bonuses. My contention is, I can't prove it, my contention is that if we cancel those bonuses, the bonuses offered to get people to enlist, the bonuses offered to get people to re-enlist, that the all-volunteer force would collapse probably in a matter of six months. So, again, people join for all kinds of reasons, but I think it is important to recognize the, the role of economic incentives in sustaining this force. 
And in that sense, no, it's not really an all-volunteer force. So you're the president, I believe, of the Quincy Institute, which is a relatively new organization that I think is devoted to questioning and trying to provide a counterpoint for this post-Cold War militaristic consensus. Could you tell us you know, what, that is, what the Institute is about and how you, what's the game plan? How are you, how are you going about you know, fighting this, this idea? Okay, so, so we are a small startup. Uh, the circumstance that we just described is uh, deeply embedded and, and is shared, I think, by most members of the establishment. So the first point to be made, I think, is that we got one hell of a long haul against us if we're actually going to have any have any impact. Uh, we're a think tank. I, I'm not in Washington. My, my home is in uh, Massachusetts, and I don't have any intention to move to Washington. But the headquarters of the Quincy Institute is in Washington. What are we doing? We're doing what other think tanks do. We are we are we we write, we uh, issue policy papers. You know, we do op eds. We respond to requests for interviews, all of which are intended to promote our principles and to promote recognition that we've been fighting too many wars that don't make any sense and cost a lot of money. We, uh, not me, but uh, my colleagues in Washington, uh, engage regularly with members of Congress and members of congressional staff and with other like-minded uh, uh, nonprofit organizations in Washington. As you know, there's a bazillion of them. What we hope to do over a period of time is begin to, to change the climate, to change thinking. Somebody sent me a piece uh, from the New York Times that appeared a couple days ago that talked about the changing attitude toward wars. Uh, in Washington, it quoted one of my Quincy Institute uh, colleagues, which is which is a good thing for us. But uh, you know, I, you know, how how long how long did it take to to mobilize serious opposition to to slavery? It took a long time. You know, the abolitionist cause uh, was something that took quite a long time to mature. Uh, to persuade the mass of Americans that slavery was an evil. I'm not comparing our wars to slavery, but it, but only to make the point that when habits are deeply entrenched, they're not easily undermined and overturned. So we know we have a long way to go. I mean, it's, especially, it's really remarkable, just to repeat a point I made earlier, that you kind of won the argument with the last two presidents, but you view prevailed, I think, for both Obama and Trump, at least intuitively, but it failed in practice. I have to agree with you. Uh, and and it, why did it fail in practice? Because, because, because the status quo does work to the benefit of some. You know, members of Congress, not all, but, but some number, rely on the support they get from the military-industrial complex in terms of donations and the like to help fund their re-election campaigns. Uh, they, they, they would be roundly criticized if they allowed some military post or defense contractor plant uh, to be shut down uh, in, in their district. So they have an interest in sustaining high levels of, of military spending. They don't have an interest in, in scrutinizing uh, critically. Uh, the size of the military budget or or the general posture of the United States military. I think that, that's one example. There are others. There, there are quite a number of think tanks in Washington that basically stay in business because they accept money from components of the military industrial complex. Okay, let's move back to the main thread of the book, which is that the reaction to the Cold War set in place the conditions that led to things happening in the country that ultimately resulted in Trump's election. So, which I think is the central and provocative claim of the book. So just give us the short version. How and why did, did these factors lead to Trump? Well, they failed. I mean, they, they failed to, the, 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 the promise of globalization, the promise of military supremacy, enabling us to both keep order and advance our values, the promise of individual autonomy leading to a new definition of freedom that worked to the benefit of the common citizenship. In my estimation, these failed, uh, and they all produced negative consequences. 
And over time, the American people came to recognize those negative consequences. And so they rose up in 2016 to reject what I call the post-Cold War consensus. They, in doing so, they did not install in the White House an individual who, who offered a coherent critique of the post-Cold War consensus. He did not offer a coherent alternative to the post-Cold War consensus, but his election, in my judgment, uh, amounted to a repudiation of what, what that consensus provided for. And again, to emphasize, it's because the consensus didn't work. How, wh what's the evidence that it didn't work? Well, the evidence with regard to globalization, uh, most vividly, uh, is the, the Great Recession that began in uh, 2007, 2008. Uh, with millions thrown out of work, with millions finding they're, uh, they're unable to afford their, their mortgages. Where's, where's the evidence that, that military supremacy didn't, didn't produce order in advancing American goals? Well, the evidence is the Afghanistan war, now the longest in our history. It's the Iraq war, uh, which also was very, very long and certainly didn't, didn't produce, didn't transform Iraq uh, into a liberal democracy. And I think it's also evident in, in some of the uh, pathologies that are so rampant in our country. We, we, are, we are freer today than at any time in our history. Uh, and the advances of freedom had wor have worked to the advantage of, of, of people who, who didn't previously enjoy freedom, particularly women and, and people of color and, and, and gays. But it is astonishing, uh, the epidemics of what? Uh, porn, of uh, obesity, of, of, of gun violence, and, and on and on that I recount in, 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 in briefly in one of my chapters that, that seem to suggest that even though we may be free, there's something fundamentally amiss in our society. And I think that the, that the people who elected Donald Trump in 2016 were saying, we've had enough of this. We, we, we ain't buying what the elites have been selling since since uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall. And to be clear, you're extremely hard on Trump. I mean, you clearly don't care for him very much. But your point oh. is, your point is that I think you say at one point he's not terribly competent. He not doesn't necessarily know what he's doing, but he has a. You don't call it a good bullshit detector, but it's something like that. He has a sense. He had a sense that the elite consensus in the parties was baloney. And he called them on it. And your claim is that's why he won. Yeah. And some of it is, it, it's brilliant. I mean, it's hard to know whether we should, that the brilliance reflects sort of uh, political smarts and calculation or whether it's more just uh, intuition. But, you know, his claim that he's going to drain the swamp, boy, that resonated uh, with a lot of people who, who had come to see the elites in Washington as, you know, detached from the from the rest of the population and not acting in, in the interests of the rest of the population. You know, his provocative uh, of resurrecting the phrase America first. Again, there was a certain genius to that because it, it, it resonated with Americans who, who could not understand uh, why we had gotten ourselves in these wars that drag on and on and on uh, without uh, with, with enormous costs that they bear uh, and without any prospect of a positive outcome. So you, in the book, I think it's, you're very critical of the reaction to Trump, the elite reaction to Trump, and explain this, but you basically argue that the reaction to Trump has bucked Trump up. It's, you know, it's fed into his claim that he's this important historical figure and that it's largely been an overreaction because he hasn't actually accomplished very much. Can you explain that? Yeah, I, I mean, I see him as a, actually quite a weak president. I mean, I mean, he's done a lot of stupid stuff, you know, whether we're talking about uh, withdrawing from the Paris uh, Climate Accord, withdrawing from the Iran nuclear deal, uh, uh, to, to build the wall as a response to an immigration crisis. One could go on and on. Uh, but my guess, and I, I think many would, of course, disagree with this, is that when he departs office, that his legacy will tend to be rather limited that if we end up with an, a successor who's got a certain amount of common sense, uh, we'll be able to undo uh, much of the damage that he has, he has done. My criticism of political elites is that their 
preoccupation with Trump becomes an excuse not to be sufficiently attentive to the, the matters that brought Trump into office in the first place, the inequality in our economy, the mindlessness of our military policies, uh, and so on. That, that's where, in my judgment, the political conversation ought to be focused, not on whether or not he was trying to uh, get President Zelensky uh, to investigate uh, the Bidens in order to gain some political advantage. Y yes, he did that. There's no question. Uh, but it seems to me that focusing on that kind of wrongdoing misses the larger point. And it also misses the larger point of, you know, what caused Trump. And the most, one of the most vivid images in the book is when you describe Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton as Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. And it's a nice way of making the point that most of Trump's critics have the causation backward about his influence. Can you explain that? Well, I'm, of course, I'm not a Shakespearean scholar, but it seems to me that uh, Rosencrantz... But you, you, you invoke Stoppard's play as well. Yes. Uh, and, and Stoppard treats them as comic figures. And I think to some degree that's the role of, of Trump and, and Hillary Clinton in our, in our politics. We treat them as if they are world historical figures. But I believe that a decade from now or a generation from now, we will come to see them as bit players who recited a certain set of lines because they were expected to but who were largely uh, irrelevant uh, to the history of their time. I mean, I guess this, this reflects sort of a larger historical or histi historiographical sort of perspective. When I was in graduate school, I must say I certainly believed in the great man theory of history. Uh, you know, if you wanted to understand the United States in the 20th century, you needed to study Theodore Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson and Franklin Roosevelt and and, uh, and Harry Truman, and and that's what that's what this what what they they defined uh, the events that unfolded. And I simply don't don't believe that any longer. It seems to me that uh, presidents and and other leaders tend to be responding to historical forces that they understand at best imperfectly. And to the extent that they can, you know, nudge things uh, in one way or the other, they they can accomplish something. But but they're not driving the train. You know, it, it gets to my argument that uh, we just vastly, I think, uh, overstate the significance of the presidency. So in the last chapter, you offer some prescriptions for how we can do better as a nation. Can you just summarize what those are? Well. You know, and I'm, uh, this is probably the weakest part of the book, as it tends to be in books like this. Uh, one of my personal weaknesses, I think, is probably I'm too subject to uh, a certain nostalgia about the past. I try to correct for that. But I do believe uh, that half century ago, there was in our imperfect country some prevailing sense of the common good that could provide the basis for uniting our very diverse people to a very considerable extent. That notion of the common good derived from the Cold War, it derived from the conviction, uh, which was distorted, but nonetheless d derived from the conviction that we were indeed engaged in this epic confrontation between freedom and slavery and, and the God-fearing and the godless and, and, and so on. That notion of a common good disappeared after the Cold War. Uh, and, and therefore, the glue to hold us together uh, no longer existed. And we need to recover that. My own suggestion is that the way, the, the, the means to recover that is offered in climate change. Uh, that this is, this is the common threat uh, to all of us as Americans and indeed to all the planet. Uh, and if we recognize that threat for what it is, that can be the basis then of healing our divisions uh, and of moving beyond this this period of enormous uh, antagonism and bitterness that defines uh, the Trump era. So I thought this is a great book, and I did find the last chapter, this part of the book, the weakest part. 
as you say, it often is when you move from the descriptive and analytical to the normative. And I found it the weakest because um, I'm, maybe I'm more pessimistic than you, but you know, you, you spent the whole book talking essentially about how degraded our political and cultural and moral system is. And it's just not clear to me how we, in the midst of that, kind of suddenly find a common virtue or common cause or recover our civic virtue or and climate change is, is at least today a very divisive issue. So I guess the challenge is, and it's not you're not the only one who's writing about this challenge. There are a lot of books that basically uh, come to despair in the face of this question. But the question is, how do we get back, if at all possible, that um, that element of common enterprise and, for lack of a better phrase, maybe this is the right phrase, national identity? Well, I don't I don't know how to get get back, but I would I guess I, I take some co consolation in my conviction that we've done it before. You know, slavery is a good example, a, a cause that did mobilize, not everybody, I mean, it divided the nation. We had to fight a civil war to, to actually resolve it. But, it. but it mobilized, created a moral cause that made a difference. I think you could make the same argument about the progressive era. You know, as industrial capitalism creates this divide between the rich and everybody else and condemns a large numbers of, of, of our fellow citizens to a life of, of, of cruelty and squalor. We find the capacity to institute a set of reforms that didn't, didn't overturn capitalism, in many respects saved capitalism, but also then muted the negative effects of of the Industrial Revolution in a whole variety of ways, Ma making workplaces safer, uh, you know, protecting children from being thrown into factories at an early age, uh, providing for a safe workplace, decent salary. And I think something of the same happened again in the, in the, in the Great Depression with the New Deal. Uh, with, with this period of experimentation, only partially successful, but nonetheless, a, a, a period of bold experimentation trying to redress what, what were the, the, the most terrible uh, aspects of American life at that particular time. Now, because it happened before, it doesn't mean it's going to happen again. And, and, and nor, nor am I able to sort of point to the five or six sort of signs that we should pay attention to that will tell us uh, if, if some kind of... A, reform and rejuvenation is is underway. But I do have a certain confidence in the the resiliency, I guess, of our of our system. Uh, and therefore, at least I have a hope that we'll be able to overcome the the terrible problems that we face today and the problems, you know, not not just Trump with Trump being certainly a a, a major example. That semi-optimistic note is maybe a good place to stop. Andrew Basevich, thank you very much. Oh, thank you. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. Thanks this week to Andrew Basevich for coming on the show. His book is The Age of Illusions, How America Squandered Its Cold War Victory. Please rate and review the Lawfare Podcast and share us widely. The podcast is produced by Jen Patia Howe, and I was your audio engineer. Your music is performed, as always, by Sophia Yan. Thanks for listening. <laughs>